I never know, I'm really, really bad at writing lectures. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I never know what I'm going to talk about until I'm walking to the place. And Maria said some things yesterday that uh, made me think about what I wanted to talk about today. So yesterday, I talked about um, the top of that orange part of the brain and, I, and the bottom of the green part. So yesterday, we did the uh, amygdala and hypothalamus. So today, I want to do a different part of the brain. Today, I want to talk about the left part, the bottom left part of that green brain. And it's called the ventral striatum. And so if you do neuroscience, you already, where's Josh? So Josh already knows, oh, he's the same spot. <laughs> so Josh already knows what I'm gonna talk about today. So if you do neuroscience, you'll know why I wanna talk about ventral striatum. Uh, so that's all, the, that's all the brain pictures you're gonna get. Um, and I thought the best way to start uh, wherever we go in our, we have this thing called the Canadian Self-Regulation Initiative, and we're going to talk a little bit about the politics of this at the very end, so I can try to address Maria's very serious, uh, the very serious issues that she was raising, and how we've gone about it. Uh, in the initiative, what we do is we go into uh, very troubled communities, uh, it is, in fact, a universal initiative, which means that we work with all children, and it's important to stress that the problems that we are seeing in children today uh, are occurring in all children. Uh, they are growing every single year. They are um, oblivious of socioeconomic status. So this is a problem for all Canadian children. And I'll give you just one example of what I mean. Um, our clinic was set up to deal with children with autism and ADHD. And over the last two years, almost all of our work is with anxiety. We are overwhelmed by families coming in because of a child with anxiety. And in fact, there was a very large study done in Canada in the year 2012, and you can read the study online. It's called the TDSB, TDSB study on anxiety. It's the largest sample ever done in Canadian history. It was, we looked at 103,000 children. And 76% of children between the ages of uh, 14 and 17 are reporting an anxiety disorder. I'll just repeat that because there seems to be a translation lag. 76%, three quarters. This is astonishing. In fact, when we got the data, our head of research, uh, Devin Kazenheiser, looked at it and said, Canada is clearly doing the wrong thing. Uh, we need to be working on that last quarter and figure out how to make them anxious because they're the anomaly. All right, so this is a universal problem. But there is a gradient. Uh, so we know, that, we know that the problems are that the lower the socioeconomic status, the higher the incidents or the more severe the problems. Okay, so that's, that's, that's an issue. There's a second issue here, and that is that the problems are now occurring younger and younger. And in fact, we did another study last year, and the average median age of diagnosis of an anxiety disorder in Canada is six years old. This is astonishing, okay? Uh, in fact, in that TDSB study, uh, it's not often mentioned, but we also looked at younger children, and 56 or 7% of them were having uh, profound problems with anxiety. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, in my workshop is I'm going to talk about anxiety. Uh, I'm going to talk about something called the arousal cycle. But here, I really do want to talk about the ventral striatum and why this is a, what we feel is a core aspect of this worldwide contagion, okay? Um, we don't have great data from around the world, but we see it happening everywhere. And what we try to do every single place we go, so if we come into a community that's having a lot of trouble, um, we'll go to the superintendent, that, which is our director of schools, and we'll say, um, we need you to pick a couple of kids, so I want 
your worst cases. And on those kids, we do clinical. We cannot do clinical, when you hear these numbers, you obviously cannot do clinical on three quarters or 100% of a school population. So we pick a couple of cases that we can do clinical on. And the idea behind this is we throw all of our, our clinical team at these kids. We want, to, we want the community to see what is possible. And the reason we do this is so that uh, what we have found is the best way to get parents to come in the door is for them to see what you did for so-and-so. They all know who the kid is. So everywhere we go, um, we have these conversations, uh, you know, who are we going to pick? Who, who wins the lottery? And this one school was in Yukon. And I walked in, and uh, the principal says to me, the first thing he says to me is, uh, we've got your first candidate. He's going straight to jail. The child was seven years old, okay? So uh, I didn't need to be told which kid he was. Uh, when we walked in, this is a kid who was seven years old, all right? So he's seven years old and his future's been mapped out for him. And I should just tell you that one of the other big pieces of work we do is with Waypoint Center in Canada, and this is our leading mental health uh, facility for, the, uh, for adolescents and young adults who commit serious crimes. And when he said that, I couldn't help but think of criminals that I've seen, mentally ill criminals, young adolescents who we were working with at Waypoint, and I thought, my God, we have to do everything we can to prevent this kid from ending up there. You don't want any child to end up there. And I was horrified this morning. There's an article in the Sunday Times uh, in which Sir Michael Wilshaw is talking about his zero tolerance policy. Uh, again, you'll have to read this one. Uh, he don't give up. And uh, uh, what he's calling for now is uh, very stern zero tolerance. If you don't know who this guy is, he's the uh, chief inspector of Ofsted in, in England. And he's calling for a zero tolerance policy in all Canadian schools. And zero tolerance means that uh, Waypoint needs to triple its size. That's what it means. That's, where they, that's, what we, that's what we create when we go down the road of zero tolerance. So instead, uh, what we try to do is understand and then intervene, right? And so seven years old, it's a little old, but it's still young enough that we have hopes that we can change this kid's trajectory. That's what we're up to. Ideally, of course, what we would have liked to have done was gotten to this child when he was three or four. Um, certain things have already become entrenched by the age of seven. In fact, by the age of seven, the brain has now completed 95% of its growth. The major growth spurt that, er that Maria was talking about, that, that, that growth, growth explosion in the brain, completes around the age of 6.5. Um, that doesn't mean well, I should just caution you that the last 5% is probably the most important 5%. Um, and that continues to grow until around the age of 24. But uh, an awful lot of brain growth has happened. A lot of entrenchment has happened. There's a wonderful um, uh, Canadian, actually, who's now at Harvard called Chuck Nelson, Charles Nelson. And he has written the standard book. Uh, if, you ha if you don't know about this stuff and you'd like to learn about it, you read Charles Nelson's Development of the, Development of the Brain, I think it's called. It's a fabulous book. And it talks about how these systems become very uh, language, thinking, social cognition. They all become very entrenched by the time the child gets into grade one. So this child in question, Charles Nelson, Chuck Nelson. Charles. So the child in question was obese um, and very, very violent. And what he was doing was he was beating up the younger kindergarten children. And in Canada, children come into school at the ages of 3.8. So uh, it was quite clear that he was incapable of forming any kind of friendship. He, he did, had no interpersonal skills. Uh, so he had gone to the younger kids to try to find social companionship. They rejected him, so he beats the crap out of them. He was violent with his teachers, too. 
so he had extremely low frustration tolerance and um, uh, a list of diagnoses as long as your arm. So he had a, a number of comorbidities. And the worst part of all was, um, I agreed instantly, yeah, well, let's see if we can work with him. Um, so the first step that we do is we meet with the child and his parents. And the parents who came into the office were mom and grandmother, no father. And mother was covered with bruises. So I thought immediately, I mean, it was quite clear that someone was abusing her. And I immediately thought that she was in a bad spousal, uh, a bad, she had a bad partner, and that, um, and that the child was being exposed to domestic violence. And so, you know, running through my head is that I was going to have to get in touch with CIS um, to, uh, because we can't really do any work if I've got this kind of uh, toxic uh, domestic scene going on. Child protection, sorry, uh, child protection agencies in Canada. So um, that's our first question. You know, it's all, it's all very gently done. And she says, no, uh, no partner. And so I said, well, and I pointed at the bruises on her face, and she had black eye. And, and she sort of covers her face, and then the grandmother tells me it's the boy. So here we have a case of a seven-year-old who is physically abusing his mother. And I don't know if you have this problem in Serbia or not. This has actually become a very serious problem in Canada, and I suspect the US as well. Uh, we don't know. Is the US as well, are we seeing the same incidents, the same rise? No. <laughs> Josh doesn't know, but he will find out for us. <laughs> That's his job, or it used to be his job, <laughs> until he quit. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, was our, Josh was our head of research. Um, uh, in Canada, where we do have the data, this has become a very serious issue, uh, uh, child abuse. Um, but it's the reverse, where it's the child who's abusing the parent. So um, we have to now try to get a fix on, uh, this is obviously going to be one of those cases where you know, you're sort of sorry that you had that policy of agreeing to take on two of your worst cases. Uh, um, because we don't know how we're going to solve this one. Uh, and all we did in the beginning was just try to get a, a fix on what's going on with this family. And it was pretty much what you would expect. So there had been, a, there had been spousal abuse, uh, and the husband was now in jail. And the child almost certainly had been abused. So we're looking at domestic violence, we're looking at child abuse, uh, and we suspect it was sexual as well as physical. Okay, so this is a little guy who's gotten off to a pretty rocky start in life. So the next thing we want to know is, um, okay, what are, you know, we're, we're concerned by the obesity. So, but for us, obesity is always an effect. Child obesity is an effect, not a cause. And in fact, uh, I actually have to rush back to Canada tomorrow because we're doing a big thing on child obesity and self-regulation. Uh, we're pretty sure that obesity is in fact a downstream effect of poor self-reg. Um, and won't do that here, but it's an interesting topic. So, so right away it tells us that there's some sort of a problem in the stuff that I was talking about yesterday. Some sort of a problem in an alarm system that's always on. Uh, and one of the reasons why he is gravitating to, he, he will not eat real food. Like, None. Uh, he only eats, his diet consists, his mom told me, his diet consisted of potato chips, chocolate bars, and pop. But this is not, don't say that. It's not unusual. It's this, you would not believe how many children we, in fact, at our clinic, every single kid has to go on a detox before we start. It's unbelievable how, this, how much this has happened, where children don't eat food anymore. But when you do self-regulation, it tells you why they are gravitating towards so-called foods that, well, one aspect that gives them instant energy, instant energy release with, unfortunately, toxic side effects. Okay, so we already know that there's a problem with self-reg. Uh, so the kid's not, the kid is not, um, he's not eating at all, like he doesn't eat any food. Terrible sleep. Absolutely terrible sleep. So the kid is chronically underslept. 
And when we look at uh, stressors in Canadian children, that our number one stressor is sleep. And there are two aspects of this, and if we have a chance, if I don't, if I don't distract myself too much, I'll tell you why. Um, the two aspects that we look at in children are amount of sleep and quality of sleep. And we are seeing a crisis in Canadian kids in quality of sleep, in what's called non-restorative sleep. So I'll try to explain what that is and why it relates to this case. Um, so we've got a kid who's not eating, we've got a kid who is underslept, absolutely no exercise, has no friends, not a single friend in the world, so nobody to have that kind of regulating, calming effect. So I said to mom, okay, so what does he do? Uh, he plays something called Call of Duty. Now, do you have that over here? Okay, so you know what Call of Duty is. So this is shocking to us. He's seven years old, and he's playing Call of Duty. Right? This is a game that's marketed for children 18 and over. So that's an interesting question in its own right. You can you figure it out where I'm going with this with ventral striatum? Good. So, um, so we want to know why, but we have to be very, very careful here. And the reason we have to be so careful is that we don't judge mom. Because what's happening is that mom is letting him play all the time. Mom has three jobs. Mom is doing, this is a good woman. This is a woman who is trying to do the best for her kid and she's exhausted. She's, uh, the reason Granny had come in with her was because mom was going off, mom has to go off to do her night job. This is just to make ends meet. So are we gonna blame this woman if, if um, letting the kid go on the computer for a couple of hours or four hours gives her that respite, that break from this kid who's just a real handful. Um, we try never, we don't blame anybody, right? And we just, we always try to put ourselves in that position, what would I do? But one of the very first questions we asked her was, uh, when does he hit? And I'm sure you can all figure this one out, when he hits. It's when she forces him to turn off the, turn off the game. Okay, so, so we know that the game is doing something to him. And in fact, what it's doing is affecting this ventral striatum. So what we wanted to know was, um, why is all this happening? Does, is there a pattern here? Does it apply to all children? And now the next step is going to be, what do we do about it? And the ventral striatum is a very interesting little system. And what it does is, it has two branches to it. And so when scientists study this, they, they look at a part called the nucleus accumbens. And basically what this, this, this little tiny, you know, smaller than a pea does, is when we have a really um, pleasant experience, the, the ventral striatum releases a rush of opioids. Opioids are really, really nice. So what opioids do is they inhibit the neurons that transmit pain. So we become much less sensitive to physical pain, emotional pain. Uh, and also, opioids have a sedating effect. Opioids are wonderful. And we get opioids from all kinds of things. We get opioids from breast milk. Uh, so nature clearly wanted uh, children to breastfeed. But mom gets opioids by breastfeeding. So uh, my wife assures me that breastfeeding is not the walk in the park that people assume. So nature compensates by giving mommy a little opioid rush too. I guess it hurts. Um, we get opioids from sex. Big, big rush of opioids from sex, from orgasm. Uh, so nature wanted us to procreate. So it takes this stuff seriously. And we get a lot of opioids from sugar. Sugar causes a big release of opioids. So we get, we get opioids from all kinds of things in life. And then when we've had an experience, when we've had this opioid rush, the other part of the ventral striatum kicks in. And this is the release of something called dopamine. And dopamine is very, very serious for guys like me and Josh. Um, basically, what dopamine does is it says to the brain, 
I want another shot of that. So imagine your primitive hominid and you stumble across a fig and you eat this thing and you get this opioid response. And then the dopamine kicks in, the other side of this, this system called the reward system, and it will drive you until you get another, another fig. And it is relentless in driving us forward to get another fig. So these two aspects of the ventral striatum drive our behavior. The search for pleasure, and then the dopamine system driving us onwards. There's a fantastic book that's just come out called Your Porn on Brain. Uh, no, Your Brain on Porn by Gary Wilson. This is a good book. Gary Wilson, uh, Your Brain on Porn. And basically, we got interested in this because there was a big study done in Canada recently reporting that over half of all males between the ages of 16 and 21 have sexual dysfunction. Half of our boys have sexual dysfunction. Uh, including, uh, uh, the large percentage of them have erectile dysfunction. Why? Well, it's one of the after effects of too much dopamine. Why too much dopamine? Because they're watching porn. And what porn does is it releases the, the dopamine and because of the pervasiveness of porn and because of the, because of the ease with which a kid can have access to porn today, they just, they're getting, they're having a surfeit of porn, but it's having an effect on their ability to mate. And basically, that's why Canadian neuroscientists became concerned, because uh, what we're seeing now is an explosion of these, uh, of the so-called mating rituals that you expect to see in young adults. Anyways, that's an interesting stuff, and it's a good book. For us, the real issue here is the dopamine. Okay? We know, we have known since 1997 that a child, that, sorry, that dopamine levels double playing video games. Yeah. That's a well replicated finding. It's been, re re and I should just add that that was done on early games. That was not, so we don't even know what the effect on the dopaminergic system is from contemporary games. But we have a problem here. And the problem is that this dopamine-driven effect, dopamine drives our behavior. This dopamine-driven effect, we become habituated. Can I use that word, habituated? So the effects wear off. So we need more and more to get the same effect. All right, I'll give you a real simple example. Uh, I came back to Canada from England in 1986, and my first job was a horrible job. It was, it was a good job, but it was very high stress. And uh, I discovered something called Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. So Robin will know what those are. <laughs> so, um, uh, so Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, um, uh, they are the essence of the manipulation of this system I'm talking about. Uh, because we know that there is this thing called the bliss point. The bl Have you heard about this stuff? Okay, I'll give you another book. Forgive me, but this is a book worth reading. It's called The End of Overeating by David Kessler. David Kessler was the head of the FDA. Uh, this is a must-read book because it explains the effect of junk food on the dopamine system. Food, junk food has been designed to maximize dopamine release. And the way it works is that there's a thing called the bliss point. And the bliss point is, the bliss point represents the point where a food releases the maximum amount of opioids. And there are three ingredients that determine the bliss point. This will all make sense to you in two minutes, just stay with me. The three ingredients are sugar, sugar, salt, and fat. So what they do is they experiment with sugar, salt, and fat to get that perfect that perfect mixture where you get maximum opioid release. That's the bliss point. Why would an American food producer want to have a food that had a bliss point? Figure that one out. Why would they do this? Why is huh? She's right. That's exactly why.
Because what it does is it releases dopamine. And the dopamine says, I want another shot of that. And another, and another, and another. But the problem, so your sales go up. But the problem is, and it is unbelievable how much thought and science has gone into maximizing the bliss point of every conceivable food. But now you've got a problem, and the problem is that we get used to the effect. So when I came back to Canada, um, I found this, this uh, Reese's peanut butter cup, and a tiny little nibble, just a tiny little bit, was all I needed to calm down to, and I didn't understand any of this at the time, and, and, you know, and deal with the things that were on my desk that night. And before the term was over, we, semesters, terms in Canada, before it was over, I was going to Costco, which is a large big box uh, uh, store in Canada, and I was buying Reese's peanut butter cups in boxes like this. <laughs> so for the first time in my life, I had gained weight. I never gained weight. But that's the problem with these foods. The problem with the foods are, A, it's giving me energy, and B, what it was doing was I was eating it for the sed sedating effect. Unfortunately, in this case, this is a non-adaptive coping strategy because, yes, I was addicted to it. I was addicted to, literally, I was addicted to Reese's peanut butter cups. And finally, I got over that and became addicted to uh, Nielsen's butter brickle ice cream. I had a rough first year in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm addicted to lots of things. Uh, I'm, addicted to, uh, I'm addicted to running. Uh, I'm addicted to, I loved my breakfast this morning at the Hyatt because I'm addicted to Bach. So some of my addictions are actually pretty good for me. Some of my addictions are adaptive. They, they produce more, more benefit than harm. But a maladaptive one, like junk food, produces obesity. Okay? So, shoot. I love talking cases, but cases take a long time. So, this kid was getting a dopamine kick from junk food. That's why he was eating it, to calm himself down. The stresses in his life were too great. So he was eating junk food, but the dopamine effect was wearing off. So he had discovered Call of Duty. And Call of Duty was, a, was doing exactly the same thing to this little guy. It, he was, this game, if you don't know this game, it is stupid beyond belief. There's nothing interesting about it. There's nothing intrinsically rewarding about this game. It's horrible. But for a scientist, we don't make moral judgments. We ask ourselves, why? Why would anybody want to play something that's so stupid? And the answer is, he's not choosing. And that was everything we did yesterday about choice. This is not a conscious decision. It's not... All that's happening is his ventral striatum is being manipulated, it's being driven. And this is real scary for us. And it's real scary for us because we know where this trajectory is going. We know that, that the effects of Call of Duty are going to... Seven-year-olds should not be spending so much time on this, so we know what the next stage is going to be. We know that within a couple of years, this kid's going to be on drugs. It's going to get... So yes, he will end up in prison. Yes, he will end up in Waypoint. Everything we know about the neuroscience tells us that this child's trajectory has been set. So now, this has gone way beyond... Uh, so, so what are you going to do? You're going uh, to come down on him with, with a hammer? This behavior is not tolerated? So if you do it again, what does that mean? It means that they will expel him. That's what zero tolerance means. So now... I've taken this kid who's on this trajectory and I've put him unsupervised, because mom's got three jobs, in the very environment which is creating all these stresses. I've done the worst thing I possibly could have done for this child. What this child needed was he needs to be part of an institution where we can begin the healing process. And that's what we do. With, that's what we're doing with Canadian self reg So what we're doing is we're going into these, into these preschools and into primary schools and trying to transform these into healing institutions. All right. So we have various techniques that we work with kids like this. And uh, so our very first attempt turned out to be the one that worked. And what we use is... Uh, 
swimming pool, a kid's swimming pool that's four feet high filled with styrofoam balls. And so it's called a ball pit, or it's called a ball pit. And uh, so the kid, uh, so um, our OT, our occupational therapist says to him, okay, so let's do this. Uh, you jump into the pool and uh, when you're ready, we'll start to, you know, we'll just talk a little bit. So the kid dives into the pool and he goes to the bottom of the pool and he don't come out. Why? He's, uh, he's lying now flat on the bottom of this thing and he doesn't come out. And I'm, I'm serious, like doesn't come out. We're talking 20 minutes. Why did he not come out? Why is he lying under there? What's this telling us? You want to take a shot? Isolation security. Good one. Both good. Isolation security. I like those. What else is he getting? So isolation security. That's interesting, eh? No, seriously. That's a good one, right? So he's, it's dark. There's nobody talking. There's nobody yelling at him. So that's important. What else is he getting from it? Okay, you guys have to go and find a ball pit and lie at the bottom of a ball pit to figure this one out. The, huh? Okay, so... Did you hear what he said? So what he's doing is he is self-regulating. He is soothing his nervous system. I don't know what, I don't know all the different things that are happening here, but I suspect it's having this calming effect because it's blocking out all noise. There's the weight of the balls, so this is probably soothing his nervous system. Maybe the, maybe the smell is, is calming it. So she says to him, so finally he comes out, and he comes out smiling. And you remember everything I said yesterday about the smile, right? So, okay, uh, we don't have to go any further with this kid. So she says to him, uh, so, so the therapist meets with the teacher, and she says, okay, this is what we like to try. So what we're going to try to do is we're going we're gonna to let him, whenever he wants, put the, uh, we want to put the ball put, there was an empty classroom right next door, so whenever he wants, just let him get up, go into the ball pit, and he'll come back when he's ready, Okay. And that's what they did. So at the end of this year, I get uh, reports from all of the cases that the therapists are working on. So I get this kid's case in, and this case just blows me away. The kid now has friends. Uh, the kid is non, he's, uh, we have these uh, indices of disruptive, non-disruptive. So he's become non-disruptive. He's become, he's become a normal, a normal seven-year-old. So I got to see it for myself. So I go up to the school up in Whitehorse, and uh, the first thing that happens is I walk in the school, and they have a display case in the front, and it's full of plasticine Play-Doh. If you hit, okay, Play-Doh um, scenes of First Nation of Aboriginal life, and uh, like you know, like a longhouse, the way the traditional natives play, and they're fabulous. I'm looking at them. And the principal greets me, and I said, this is fabulous. Like, and I thought there was a lot of artists up there, and I know the, one of them. And I said, did so-and-so do it? And she said, no, you're never going to believe this. This was C. C is the kid. C did this. <sighs> so what they did was um, they, there's a, 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 an American called Barbara Reed, and she is a gift for working with little kids. And Barbara Reed teaches children how to make uh, art using Play-Doh. And so we now use this. We, apologies to Barbara Reed, I don't know if she's still alive, but we photocopy her books everywhere. Uh, because the, this action is very soothing for the child. And so now what we can do is we can get the child to self-regulate with us, without us having to try to um, you know, talk him into it. He's doing it, he's not self-regulating, he's doing art. Okay, so I, talk, I go to meet the teacher, and I said, you gotta tell me, like, how did you get him to this point? And so she laughs. And she says, well, in the beginning, every five minutes, the bloody kid is jumping up and going next door. But then she said something interesting happened around Christmas. Well, that's very interesting because we'd started in September. And she said, around Christmas, he stopped going. So what was going on here? Well, what was going on was that just knowing he could do this was empowering. Just knowing that when he was getting agitated, he did not want to lose control. No kid does. 
But he had no choice, right? And the more he was getting anxious, the more agitated he was getting, he had to sit there and then somebody starts to yell at him and then bam, you get the explosion. So now we had given him something that he could do and knowing that he had this removed the anxiety that he was feeling. It was getting spilling over into an arousal cycle. And then what happened was, so typically what we want to do is we want to um, we want to get kids exercising. That's our number one choice because that's where we get our biggest bang for our buck. But he had a number of um, uh, can I just say motor problems, right? See, so he was clumsy. He was clumsy. Just say that. So for him, sport, which is what all these kids do, was in fact yet another source of stress both the physical aspect of it and the embarrassment that he felt because he, he ran funny, uh, he couldn't catch a ball with one hand, so he had a bunch of things going on there. But what he really loved was art. Okay, so I'm looking at this, and art is very, so we've looked at four things, and art is our third most regulating activity for a kid. So we're looking at this and we say, okay, well, art it's gonna be. So they have in Yukon, they have this, um, they have this, uh, master carver. Carving is a real big thing in the north. A uh, guy called Keith Smarch. And so we arranged for him to come in uh, and train under Keith Smarch. So now this kid is, I don't know, he must be, this is, he's about 11 years old now. He's going to be a master carver. That's where he's going to end up in life. And think about it, right? So, you know, it's counterintuitive. You're giving the kid a knife? Yeah. Right. So, but it's very regulating for him. And now, on top of everything else, he's getting self-esteem, right? So now he's something. He has something that he can be proud of in his life. But what fascinated us about this example was the ripple effect. Because by putting his Play-Doh scenes in the, in the foyer, mom and grandma came into the school, and then the next thing you know, the whole bloody extended family, which in, a, which in an Aboriginal community is basically everybody, is, is trooping through to see the kids' art. So now, these were people that we could not get to come into the school. And now they don't see the school as a threat. They don't see it. Now, instead, it's a source of pride. And so overnight, what's happened is, then the next step is, we start getting these people volunteering that they can do certain things. Would you like this? Would you like me to, I'll give you an example. Would you like me, one of them said, um, would you like me to, do, to come in and show the kids how to make uh, beef stew? Uh, not beef, uh, moose stew. So hunting is a big thing in the north. So another one comes in and says, well, you know, if they're going to make the moose stew, we might as well teach them what moose tracks look like. So, they, so this guy comes in, and, he, and one of our most successful programs in the far north of Canada is called animal tracking. Because what it does is it gets them outdoors, they're exercising, they're concentrating. Uh, it's all very soothing in all kinds of ways. But we're looking at this now as community building. So I was working very closely. Yeah, so I'm, this is the last part for you. So I was working very closely with this guy called Clyde Hertzman. And so, so oh, how much time do I have? I can't see it. OK, so I was working really, really closely with this guy called Clyde Hertzman. And Clyde, Clyde's big thing in Canada was community uh, empowerment, community strengthening. And so what Clyde, you know, so we're going over all this together. And Clyde says to me, you know, he says, the secret here is don't go to government. Go to the community. That's where you're, they have these skills. So that's what we've been doing. So what we find is we've got somebody who knows how to bake and she teaches baking. And so we've gone very big now in BC, Yukon, Northwest Territories into what's called experiential learning. For us, this uh, has been... Um, this has been a shocking learning curve for us, and I'll tell you why. Oh, by the way, that, that kid is as representative as any kid you could find. Mm -hmm. He is still a fat little kid. That doesn't bother us, okay? Because, you know, it's very hard for them. You know, he's a clumsy kid. He's not gonna, it's, it's gonna be hard, but at least when he's at school now, he's eating things that the elders prepare, so he's getting good food. So, we, so, so in the meantime, 
what has disappeared as we got that reward system in the ventral striatum and back into balance, guess what happens? The aggression stops. And when the aggression stops, now his peers, well, yeah. so he's got friends again. Okay? Now it turns out that it wasn't that he couldn't develop interpersonal skills, it was just we had to, we had to figure out how to, how to break the arousal and all that stuff. So, oh my God, you're telling me that, that these kids that are headed towards waypoint don't end up, have to end up there? Yeah. So, so okay, Stuart. Um, so Fraser says, you know, you got to go to Ottawa and, and you got to tell this to the politicians. You got to tell them that all this money you're spending on Waypoint for 1 16th of what you're spending, I can prevent these trajectories. And you have to tell them that where the money has to go. Okay, so I did it. So I go up to Ottawa and I presented in front of, uh, I presented in front of joint parliament. So I've got the MPs and the senators. And... Uh, one of the ministers says, so he's interrupting me, right? And I'm trying to explain to him, and this is a powerful minister. I'm trying to explain to him why boot, he, he, he in Canada represents boot camp mentality, and they call it boot camp. Boot camp is a militaristic type of discipline for young children. And so we have tons and tons of data on this. It doesn't work. Uh, it's, it, it, it just doesn't work. And so, uh, and there's been a nice better review that was done on this. So I'm saying to him, yeah, but you see, minister, I said that, uh, and he's accusing me of being, and he says to me, oh, he says, Dr. Shanker, you're just another one of these something something liberals. I said, no, I'm not. I am actually, but no, I'm not. I'm just a scientist. And I said, what the data tells us is, and he interrupted me. And he says to me, I don't care what your data says. I sat there with my mouth open, like, how do you answer that? You don't care what my data says. Why are you asking me to do these studies then? But that's what he said, because he came, he was one of the life success stories. So this is how he was raised, and he survived it, and he internalizes it, and what worked for me is going to work, it's going to work for everybody. And nothing I could have said, if he won't even look like I had charts, not like today, <laughs> I came equipped with, with graphs, but he wouldn't even look at them. So I came back from that and I said to Fraser, you know, we need another strategy. And this is the strategy we came up with. We're going to do an end run. Okay? And what that means is we're going to go after the people that are working with children and families. And we're going to work with them directly. And we're going to say to them, we'll find whatever money we can. And you're going to have to find it. We do something that Josh does. It's called paying forward. So we would, we would volunteer our services, but they in turn had to volunteer theirs. And if you do a large crowd, it has a huge ripple effect. And we started off, when we launched this, um, in 2012. So it was a very quiet launch. And we only did it in three school districts to 50 people, and our idea was that we were going to, and this is the part I wanted to talk about for you too. So our idea was that we're gonna really support these 50 uh, early, um, most of our work is done with ECEs, I don't know if you have that here, early childhood educators, ECEs and primary school teachers, and then we branched out into high school. So, uh, but we saw the ECE, the early childhood educator, as the sort of uh, heart of this program, because they're the ones that have this background in human development, whereas teachers are trained in curriculum. And so what we wanted to see happen was partnerships between an ECE and a teacher, yeah, which is in fact what happened. Anyway, so we did, we, our idea was we're gonna train these 50 and we're gonna give them as much training as they need. And then they'll become our ambassadors for the next wave. That's, that was the idea. So. The following year, we had an institute for those 50 people. 1,000 people showed up. We hadn't advertised it. All of this was by word of mouth, okay? Then, before we knew it, um, we were asked, we are now in about half of Canada, and it's, even this morning I was reading, now Alberta wants to go. All of this was done without any government support. 
Now what's happening is now we've reached the point now that government is coming to us because government sees what's happening and we are, you know, we're very divided in our own thinking about whether we accept their support because self-regulation is a process. It is not a program. And if they turn it, governments like programs. And if you turn it, you know, eight steps to a self-regulated kid, the problem is, uh, which I'll do in my workshop, every child is different and the little buggers change on you all the time. So what worked yesterday doesn't work today, or what worked for this class doesn't work for this class. So you have to understand, you have to understand the process, not give me three simple steps so I can calm a kid right down and he'll stay with me. So what did we learn from all this? What we learned is that we had to give way more support, way more than we ever dreamt. And what that means, how do you give support? It takes a long time to, it takes a long time to learn this stuff. And I think that one of my problems is I forgot what it was like when I was studying it, how long I took. It took, and I had, uh, I got trained by Greenspan himself. You don't know this, Josh. Uh, I had six days a week for five, for five years with Stanley. Can you imagine? And that was anywhere from one hour to like four hours. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I sort of take it for granted now, forgetting how in the beginning I was struggling because our old frameworks are so strong in how we think, how we look at this. So what we have to do is we had to figure out how do we support them on a shoestring and what kind of supports do they want? So some of the things that we've done that were really, really effective, they need a lot, a lot of support. And they need support that is personalized. And what that means is that they can present their own cases, not my cases. And this is, this is my child, or this is my class, and this is, it's not working. And I did all the things you said, why isn't it working? But we have to be very careful, because the worst thing we could do, the worst thing we could have done was to create a relationship where this is about, the new dynamic is that, that, that Dr. Shanker, or the, or the Merit Center, they know the answers. Um, and so all you, because now what we've done is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do with my seven-year-old. We wanted him to become the master of his own autonomy. And so we have to be very careful, even when we think we know the answer, not to step in. So when we look at support, what we did was, so we start off, we do online book clubs. Online book clubs have been fantastic. And so there we use one of our DIR clinicians, we use Paula, and, uh, and they meet once a week. And so they, the very first year we did this, we used my book. And so to me, my book is like embarrassingly simplistic. <laughs> but that's every author feels the same way, but I can't even read the damn thing, it makes me cringe. <laughs> and so Paula tells me, so I say to her, you know, uh, I don't know when it was, like November, so are you guys ready for the next book? They've been meeting once a week online, and she says to me, Stuart, we're still on chapter one. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you're still on chapter? Chapter one is all about how you create regulating environments. Uh, I said, I'm sorry? And she said, yeah, well, you know, like they keep on talking about, you know, like they're trying different things, and they have different ideas. And, and then she says, I hope you're not upset about this, but really we don't talk about you so much anymore, mm -hmm. um, but we're talking about... And so what has happened with... So the online book club is a very effective way for them to become a learning community. And that's what we're after, creating learning communities. What we have found is everywhere, if you guys are going to do this, what you need are you need your agents of change. You need those people who, I, I, I'm, I'm, I am so good here. <laughs> so, um, so you need... Uh, you need somebody from, somebody from the district who knows everybody, who knows the theory. We work, so what we do is we work very hard with, uh, with these leaders. So it's a train-the-trainer model. So we work hard with them. They, get, they actually get uh, free access to me. They're the only people in the world that know my, own, my private email. And the idea here is to really train to a very high level your trainers. But then what they do is they come in and they have uh, small sessions with teachers, educators, parents, 
as much or as little as they want, but always talking, but always um, uh, uh, having them present uh, video information, talking about their cases, whatever. Now, sessions like this are hugely important. Sessions like this light the spark. This is the, this creates that, that, uh, you know, I can't help but think of, like, we call our program Spark. Uh, and, and so what, what happens is you guys are going to leave from this and you've been exposed to some people that can tell you some really interesting things going on, but now what we get scared about is, okay, so everybody leaves inspired and full of hope and, you know, the greatest intentions and that lasts until Monday morning when you're back to the reality of, you know, it's not even 10 o'clock yet and I've had 16 cases that I can't handle. So we have to figure out now, as we go through this, what are the kinds of supports we can give you? So um, is it materials? Then we'll give you materials. Do you, need, do you need to have group meetings? Do you need to have teleconferences, webinars? We use everything that we possibly can. And what we have found is the most effect comes from you guys all meeting now, like, and hopefully you have lots of opportunities here, meeting, forming these relationships among yourselves that you don't let go of so you can begin to compare these ideas and build on each other's successes and build on each other's failures. Okay, so now I gotta wrap it up because I got three minutes left. So we have written a document called uh, The 10 Lessons Learned. So we will share that with you. Um, I'll just have to, I'll, I'll give it to you, it's in English, you have to translate it. The 10 lessons learned are pretty much, uh, they're pretty much universal. These are um, how we, I won't swear with you guys, how we, how we mess things up. <laughs> you will mess things up like in ways that are, it seems so easy when I talk about it, but in fact, uh, I'll just give you one little example and then I'll stop. I love headphones. So we have these headphones in Canada that we use with a chainsaw to cut wood. And so what we did was we, get in, we go into this one school, grade four class, 23 children. And uh, we had one little guy and he was a real problem. So we gave him a headphones. And we say to him, okay, put them on when you're agitated, take them off when you're ready to work. So the other kids say, I want a headphone. <laughs> okay, so we went to local business and we got the home hardware to donate 23 sets of headphones. So now every, every kid in this class has their own little headphone and they walk around from all during the day with their headphones. This class went from the worst class in the school to the model class in the school. It was an overnight sensation. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna get a Nobel for this one. <laughs> right, I figured out how to create peace and harmony in every Canadian school just with a bloody headphone. The teacher across the halls got a grade three class and she's a special ed, special education teacher background. And she sees what's happening. And her class isn't nearly as bad. Like, her class is pretty good. But she thinks, you know what? Looks pretty cool idea. So I'm going to bring the headphones in too. So her class, a uh, year younger, her class goes from, from being a relatively good class to being absolute chaos. <laughs> because what happens is the kids put the headphones on and they start shouting at each other. Because they couldn't figure out that you can't hear each other when you got the headphones on. So what worked in this class was a disaster in this class. But then what happened, maybe it had something to do with the age, I don't know. But she then, she had to coach them. So she coached them through it and taught them how to use the headphones. And finally, it started to work there too. Now the whole school's got headphones. It got, there was a big CBC thing on it in Canada about the school with headphones. The thing is that we'll give you these strategies. So we can get you to read the book. We can send you materials and you'll read them. And sometimes they're just not going to work. Sometimes it takes a little, bit of, a little bit of persistence and patience for it to start to work. But in the end, there's always something. In the end, there's always that technique that the children are going to find calming, their parents are going to find calming. And guess what happens? What happens, this is my last offer today. What happens, this is one of the most interesting aspects, and this is our 10th lesson learned. The reason we went from 50 to 1,000 is because the teacher's stress load dropped by half. Your job is a real hard job. Your job is one of the hardest jobs that I can imagine. It's also the most important job I can imagine. Uh, Maria and I were talking about this walking here. You have no idea how important this job is. 
The future of society is being set in this room. The future of society is not set by professors and it's not set by physicians. We get them way too late. This is where it's set. But it's a tough job. And it's made even worse by governments that don't acknowledge how important this job is. So at the end of the day, as we do all this stuff, now what we've instituted as our 10th lesson, self-regulation for you. You need to do it too. Okay? So it's a wonderful job. It's a demanding job. It's a stressful job. But at the end of the day, if we don't do this, uh, I have to swear once. If we don't do this, we're screwed. Okay? It's as simple as that. But guess what? This is a movement now. It's not going to stop. It is not going to stop. Okay, so good luck. Don't screw up. <laughs> okay, and then I'll come back. I'll see you in a couple of years, see how you're doing. You'll be like my seven-year-old. <laughs>